Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to speak about agarose gel electrophoresis, which is not a new technique, it's a very old technique, but it's still used until nowadays because it's a very useful technique and very important one. So let's start to, to uh, ask what is agarose gel electrophoresis. Agarose gel electrophoresis is a technique used to separate nucleic acids, uh, DNA or RNA samples. Um, it's, it uses agarose matrix gel, which is uh, composed of agarose, which is a kind of sugar. And when the agarose molecules are bound, bound, uh, are bound together, they will form something like a porous matrix or porous network, which is the agarose gel. The, it, it, it looks like this. So the pore size in the agarose gel depends on the concentration of the agarose solution. Uh, I will speak about it in a few minutes. So uh, first of all, let's speak about how to perform agarose gel electrophoresis. To perform agarose gel electrophoresis, first we should know how to prepare the gel. To prepare the gel, we need agarose. We need the buffer, which is trace borate EDTA buffer, or what we call it a TBE buffer uh, of pH 8. We need a visualizing dye, which is um, normally what we use is ethidium bromide, but since ethidium bromide has been, has been found to be very highly carcinogenic, um, and a very dangerous uh, material, some people decided to substitute ethidium bromide with other visualizing dyes like cyber green or others. Uh, what we do is that we take the agarose powder, which looks like this, and we mix it with the buffer, trace borate EDTA buffer, <clears throat> and we dissolve it. To, dis to dissolve the agarose in the buffer, we need to boil it. So we boil it in the microwave. Why do we treat the microwave? Because it's faster and because the, in the microwave, the solution doesn't evaporate. So the concentration will, will not be changed. Once the agarose is dissolved in the buffer, we add the visualizing dye. So the gel at the end will look like this, as I told you before, and the pore size depends on, uh, as I told you, depends on um, the concentration of the agarose, agarose solution. Now, um, what we do is that we take this solution and we pour it in a plastic container like this and we add this plastic uh, piece in order to create some wells uh, in the gel where we apply our samples. The gel takes uh, 20 to 30 minutes to uh, solidify and once the gel is solidified, we put this plastic container in, um, in a chamber and we fill it with the same buffer, with stress borate ADTA buffer, the same buffer we used uh, in the gel. And then we remove this plastic piece, so we end up with a gel looking like this. So this is the gel from above, this is our gel, this, these are the wells when we apply our DNA or RNA samples. What we do then is that we apply our DNA or RNA samples in these wells and then we uh, apply an electrical current using a battery or a power source applying a negative charge toward the samples and a positive charge in, on the other side of the gel. What's going to happen is that nucleic acids are going to migrate from the negative toward the positive charge. Why? Because the nucleic acids, acids are negatively charged. Why the nucleic acids are negatively charged? Because of this, because, the fo because of the phosphate. So we know that um, nucleic acids, either DNA or RNA, uh, are composed of sh sugar, either uh, ribose or dioxyribose, and the nitrogen base and phosphate groups. So the phosphate are negatively charged, and because of this, uh, any sample of nucleic acids, either uh, DNA or RNA, uh, is negatively charged. And because of this, the uh, nucleic acid samples will, will, will migrate from the negative toward the positive charge. Now, what we should do is that, first of all, we should prepare our sample. The sample of DNA or RNA is extracted from a cell. So either we extract the DNA or the RNA. Then we mix the sample with loading buffer and with the restriction enzymes. enzymes. I'm going to speak about the two of them. First, the restriction enzymes are very specific enzymes. They are endonucleases, so they, they cut the DNA 
And this thing is that why, why they are called restriction because they cut the DNA in a very, very specific place. So there are, there are many restriction enzymes, but each one of them can detect a specific sequence on the DNA, specific sequence of nucle uh, of, of, um, uh, of nucleotides. So let's say one restriction enzyme can detect the sequence of CCGT, for example, and then once this enzyme see the CCGT, it cuts down, downstream the sequence. So each restriction enzyme can detect a specific sequence and cut downstream or yeah, downstream this sequence. What we're going to have then is smaller pieces of, of DNA. Why do we apply restriction enzyme? Is because the DNA is a very long chain, so we cannot apply it um, in the gel, but we need to cut it first. The loading buffer is composed of glycerol and uh, chlor uh, coloring dye. First, the, gly the glycerol is used to increase the viscosity and then the, the density of the sample. Why? Because once we apply the sample in the well, we want the sample to settle down. Otherwise, it will be mixed with the, with the buffer and then we will lose our sample. But to increase the viscosity, when we increase the viscosity and and then the density of the sample, the sample will settle down in the well and will not be uh, mixed with the buffer. The coloring dye mostly used is the bromophenol blue. It's a blue, it's a blue dye. It's used to give uh, the sample a color so we can detect the sample uh, on the gel once it uh, migrates. We can, we can see that the sample, for example, reaches the end of the gel and then we, uh, we turn off the power source. Now, how does it work? Uh, let's see. Let's say le that this is our gel. The well will look like this from a side look. So what we do is that we apply our sample in the well, so it will look like this, and then we apply the electrical current. So the sample will start to migrate from the negative toward the positive charge. The thing is that the large sequences of DNA will stick to the gel earlier because they cannot because it depends on the pore size because they cannot migrate farther in the pores, but the smaller sequence will migrate farther and the smallest sequences will migrate the, farth the farthest. Uh, now you can imagine it this way. So let's say that this is a gel. Uh, there are pores inside. As I told you, the pore size depends on the concentration of the uh, agarous buffer solution. So yeah, the larger sequences cannot uh, migrate farther, but the smaller sequences can migrate farther. Now, why is agarose gel electrophoresis used? Or what, the, what is it used for? So let's say we have different DNA samples from different individuals, we will get different patterns. Some of the, um, some of the sequences or some of the bands will look the same and some of the bands will look differently. But why do we use it for? Of course, there are many, many applications of agarose gel electrophoresis, but I, now I want to speak about three of them, forensics, relationships, and medical diagnostics. First, let's speak about DNA fingerprinting. What is DNA fingerprinting? Uh, DNA fingerprinting is like a, it's exactly like a fingerprint. So if we take a DNA sample from any individual and we apply it on agarose gel electrophoresis, we, get, we will get different bands from another individual. Why? Because there are some there are something in the DNA called the DNA junk sequences. What are these sequences? They are junk from their name. They are junk. They are non-coding sequences. So they are not genes or anything. They are junk sequences. They are short repeats. So they are non-coding sequences, short repeats, and, and the most importantly, they are unique. So each individual has junk sequences uh, uh, which are different from another sequence. So let's say we have individual one, which had this junk sequence, C, uh, GCC, GCC, GCC. So it's a short repeat. Uh, it's GCC repeated uh, five times. Okay, and let's say we have individual two. So individual two had the same, the same repeat, but it's longer. Another individual might have might have another repeat or it might have the same repeat but it's longer or shorter. The thing is that it's different. It's different in each individual. 
So these individuals might have some identical sequences like this. For example, these sequences are identical between individual one and, or, and two. Uh, they might also have some similar sequences like this, but they are not uh, identical. And they will have the junk sequences which are totally different. So the thing is that if we take a sample, DNA samples from individual one and individual two, and we apply the same restriction enzyme in both of them, the restriction enzymes will cut the DNA differently. And so we will get different bands on the agarose gel electrophoresis. Now the question is, how can we apply this um, in the forensics? Let's say we have, a, we have a crime, we have a sample from the crime scene, and then we have two uh, suspects, uh, individual one and individual two. We apply the DNA samples from individual one and individual two on the gel, so we get uh, bands like this. So they are uh, some identical bands, and they are some uh, different bands, which are the junk sequences. This sample is taken from the crime scene, so it, it might be taken from the hair or anything found in the crime scene. Then when we apply this sample on agar gel electrophoresis, what we are going to see is that this sample this sample is, is exactly identical to individual one. And then we can say that individual individual one is the criminal. Well what I want to tell you is that of course we need to treat the three samples with the same restriction enzyme because if we apply different restriction enzyme we will get different pattern. So when we want to um, to to see like when we want to uh, compare uh, samples DNA samples we need to treat them with the same restriction enzyme. Well, we can use uh, agarose. The second uh, application I want to tell you is relationships. So let's say we have individual one, and we want to see which one of individual two and three is the father of individual one. What we do is that we apply the DNA sample from three of them. As I told you before, again, we treat the samples with the same restriction enzyme, and then we apply them. What we see is that we have some identical sequences in all of them, and we have some sequences in common, and we have some, uh, like, for example, individual one had this specific sequence which doesn't exist in uh, or banned. Why I'm telling, why I'm saying sequences is band. So we have some identical ba bands. Uh, individual one has this specific band, but if we co compare, we see that individual one has common bands with individual three, like this one, for example, this one, and this one. So individual one has more common bands with individual three than we, with individual two. Then we can say yes, individual three is the father of individual one. What we can also use the agarose gel electrophoresis for is medical diagnostics. So if we have an individual that we are doubting that he has um, a mutation in gene A, for example, how can we um, ensure about this? We get an, a normal uh, allele. So this we know that this allele is not this sequence or in this gene uh, is normal and we treat the two of them with the same restriction enzyme and then we apply them. Well, we see that we take this uh, identical bands again, but then gene, one, gene A will look differently in allele 1 and allele 2 and then I can say, yeah, there is a mutation here. Now let's see how can we visualize the gel. As I told you, for the visualization, we uh, use this visualizing dyes, which we mix with the gel. I told you we have uh, ethidium bromide, cyber green, or other. There is also a uh, methylene blue. These visualizing dyes can bind effectively with the DNA or with the RNA. Um, cyber green can bind on, only with DNA because cyber green can bind uh, with a double strand. It, it needs a double strand. So it binds only with the RNA, uh, DNA. Uh, ethidium bromide can bind with RNA and DNA. So, and, um, so when we apply the DNA samples, these uh, materials which are inside the gel, of course one of them, we use one of them, uh, these materials bind to the DNA bands and then they are fluorescent. So they, uh, they give like fluorescence. 
uh, under certain wavelengths. For ethidium bromide, it's UV. For cyber green, it's another wavelength. So this, here it is. This is ethidium bromide. It gives fluorescence under UV light. This cyber green, it, it emits light um, under 497 uh, nanometers wavelength. So this is everything I wanted to tell you about agarose gel electrophoresis. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you really, really enjoyed it, don't, don't forget to like, share with your friends, subscribe to the channel because um, uh, I really need this. Uh, then if you have any questions you can write in the comments I will answer you if you have any suggestions for uh, other videos or other topics I can speak about you can also write in the comments and see you in the next video bye